We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. My name is Martina Tersiak Noajo and I'm the Director of International Cooperation Office at the, at office of, at the Office of Competition and Consumer Protection and I, I'm sharing moderation of this panel with my colleague Karol. <laughs> Say hi again. Uh, I'm saying hi again. My name is Karol Mus and I represent European Consumer Centre in Poland based in the Office for Competition and Consumer Protection uh, in Poland. Okay, then back to me, and uh, I'll just make a really brief uh, introduction before um, before I will let the uh, before we'll, we'll continue with the workshop. And uh, welcome to everybody, of course, again online and offsite. And we are ha really happy to be here. So this panel uh, concerns sustainable consumption in e-commerce, and um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that all of you have uh, have uh, already heard lots of panels on this and and participated uh, in in conversations because that's uh, that's a very big issue nowadays. Um, not the least because of, because of the pandemic, which has even further um, exacerbated the the switch to um, to to online on, online shopping and and uh, online marketplaces have become even more. Um, important than um, they have been before, and even before the pandemic, we, we know that uh, uh, there has been um, a very, very rapid development and, and, uh, and consumers were becoming even more um, acquainted with, with shopping online. Um, but for us, uh, if you know, you're all aware of, the, of this kind of dual transition, uh, on one hand, we, we are trying to support and mitigate the risks of uh, moving online and digitalizing commerce. Um, at the same time, there is this this uh, this topic of, of green transition, um, and uh, the panel here uh, is aim, aiming at exploring this convergence of those both issues: the the digital and and uh, green transition. Uh, so we'll try to look at the different um, uh, opportunities, uh, different threads that are connected to. Uh, sustainable consumption in e-commerce, uh, trying to find the synergies between the digital transition and the green transition. So, so doing su sustainable consumption online, um, and we'll try to approach this uh, in a very, very interactive way. So we'll invite everybody here on site to speak up. And I don't know if you can see our table, but our table is full of panelists on one side and, and uh, participants on the other. Some of us are still also behind, but we invite everybody to come in front. And also everybody online can, can also speak up and, and share their views. Um, so, um, you know, when we, when we will talk about this, we also want to uh, emphasize, uh, look at this, this problem of, of sustainable consumption in, in a very broad and um, holistic way. So we'll also encourage everybody to, to share um, and to think about keywords such as uh, digital inclusion, digital sovereignty, um, to think about uh, consumer behavior online and how, how uh, online marketplaces and digital environment uh, influences consumer behavior and perception. Um, and also think about, you know, have, have a little bit of a global outlook. Uh, uh, think about developing developed countries, think about vulnerable consumers, different groups of consumers. Um, so we encourage all of you to, to think about this in a very, very broad way. Um, we have uh, on our panel a very, very nice uh, and very excellent panelists, uh, and uh, we have a very broad representation of, of different actors, so I'm, I'm quite confident that we'll be able to uh, have a very, um, a very, uh, very broad perspective on, on this uh, issue. Uh, so I'll, uh, next, I'll just introduce the, the panelists. We'll start with an introductory question uh, where everybody can, uh, can uh, uh, share their opinion from the panelists and from the participants. Uh, then we'll uh, move uh, to making a short brainstorming exercise on threats and opportunities uh, of uh, sustainable consumption in uh, e-commerce environment. 
Um, and then we'll have a question to audience, uh, but I will not tell you now what it is. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the second part of, of this uh, workshop, uh, we'll just uh, make a round of questions um, with my colleague Carol here. Um, okay, so I'll just start with introducing our, our panelists and uh, everybody there can, uh, can just switch on and, and say hi. Uh, so uh, we have Niels Bend, who is the Director for Consumer Policy at DigiJust and uh, Acting Deputy Director General of uh, DigiJust. Hi, Niels. Good morning from Brussels. Uh, Peter Andrews uh, from uh, Consumers International. Uh, he's the Director of Consumer Rights, Innovation and Impact. Good morning from London. Hey. Uh, Augustin Reina uh, from uh, Berg. He's the Director of Legal and Economic Affairs. Hello, how are you one? Hi. Uh, we have um, uh, Marta uh, Grips uh, Kabocic, if I'm speaking this right. It's a, it's a Polish name, but sometimes, you know. Yes, hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> uh, great to have you here. Um, Claire Sharwat, I'm also not sure whether I pr pronounced this correctly. Amazon, and she's a public policy manager. Thank you. This is perfect. Good morning from Paris. Hi, and we have our colleague Maciej Czaplinski, the counsel at the Department of Market Analysis at the Office of Competition and Consumer Protection. Hello, good morning, everyone. Okay, so this, uh, hi to everybody again, online and offsite. Um, so the first uh, question uh, that I think, um, and we all think, I think uh, our panelists would agree, we should start with, it's a, it's a very fundamental question uh, when thinking about um, uh, about uh, transiting to sustainable consumption in the e-commerce environment. And the question is, uh, what is the reason to transit to uh, sustainable consumption? Uh, what, is the, um, what do cons consumers gain from, from sustainable consumption and, and uh, in, in different areas, different fields? And, and uh, what is, uh, is, it, is it just an economic gain? Is it a social gain? Is it, a, is it a also environmental gain? Um, so I would like to, to share everybody to share your perspective on this. Perhaps we'll start with, with our panelists. Uh, anybody who would like to uh, raise, uh, raise your hand, uh, to speak up, please raise your hand here on, on Zoom and we'll, we'll um, share the, the floor with you. You can also speak up directly uh, and uh, anybody on, uh, on, on the online audience can also raise their hands. Uh, everybody here on site can also do the same and raise your hand physically. So I will just wait a second to see who, who would like to speak up. Otherwise, I think we can, we can start with, with just a round of, of our panelists. Uh, perhaps, Niels, would you like to share your perspective? No, with pleasure. Uh, thanks a lot, Martina. I, I think the answer to your question, which indeed is a very fundamental question, is very easy. It's the three of the, the aspects that you mentioned. Um, let's say at an individual level, and I think it's very important that the uh, engagement in sustainable consumption is not just serving the interest of the broader uh, world and the future generations. That's very important. It is a very important aspect. But at the same time, we also should make sure that the engagement on sustainable consumption is also delivering benefits for the consumers themselves. In terms of uh, having better products, products that last better, at the end, ideally, even products where if you may have to, to invest a bit more at the moment of purchase, they last longer so that over the life cycle of the product uh, that you use, you even have an economic gain. But of course, it's a mix of all. Let's say it should deliver to the consumers. Sometimes it will be more expensive, at least at the moment of purchase, sometimes even during the use of the product. And then you serve also the broader interest of our uh, generation and the future generations. But I think it really needs to be a mix. It's not just serving this, the future. It also should deliver to the benefits of the consumers today. Thanks, Niels. I think, uh, I think this, is, this is true. And uh, it's, it's definitely a big uh, issue for, for consumption and, and for, for consumers. Uh, it, it benefits them in, in, in various ways. It, it benefits in, in the in economic way. Uh, and uh, maybe on the long term, and there is always the question of differentiating long term uh, from, from short term. Uh, it has also, I guess, undou undou doubtful environmental impact. Um, 
Anybody else? Perhaps uh, maybe maybe somebody from from uh, from our other panelists would like to say something about this. Uh, Marta, maybe. Yes. So uh, so hello once again. Uh, we, I think when we analyze uh, sustainable consumption and the reasons why consumers tend to su sustainable consumption, we still, when we do the research at University of Economics in Katowice, we tend to observe that what matters the most is still the economic profit. So majority of consumers, when they turn to, for example, photovoltaic uh, solutions on, or when they uh, kind of uh, try to reduce the water consumption, they do it mainly because it gives profit to them and not because they care so much about the planet, but it is changing. And we shall focus also on the fact that uh, younger generation tend to uh, take um, a lot of um, uh, they, they, they like to educate on that matter and they like to take actions. So they, on one hand, uh, once again, care about the profits, but they care about what it gives to their health, to the, uh, to the future of their lives. So for example, the matter of uh, gas emission uh, matters a lot. Uh, what matters is what happens with the waste for example, from the digital, uh, from digital consumption. So uh, we shall take this topic very, in a very complex way. It is not an easy, uh, in, an easy answer here uh, for, for, from the perspective of the, of the reasons. But then we also kind of, uh, to, uh, kind of ask the question whether it is motives that matters or the uh, output that we have. So maybe sometimes what we shall do is we shall promote digital consumption, uh, sorry, not digital, sustainable consumption, even if the motives were not sustainable. Yeah, so, uh, so we shall consider it whether the final effect is not the most, uh, the most important. But from the perspective of university, we have to say that education and being aware is the most crucial here. Uh, so what we try to do, uh, we try to educate stakeholders, not only our students, but, uh, the, uh, but, but we try to educate uh, also uh, our future students, so kids. We try to educate um, uh, companies who cooperate with us. We try to educate uh, all their, um, our older students who used to be a part of our community, and now we invite them once again to be to be a part and we educate them in terms of digitalization and in terms of sustainability. So we hope that it will mean for them, for, for our community as such, to become more sustainable. So maybe education will be a reason to. Thank you so much. Thanks, Marta. I'll give the floor now to Agustin. Agustin, uh, the floor is yours now. Maybe there is an issue switching on. So, so Peter Andrews, perhaps uh, you could say something in the meantime. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, so I think uh, sustainable consumption um, and, and through e-commerce is really becoming more and more important to consumers for a variety of reasons, which other panelists have already outlined. I think one of the most fundamental is that uh, consumers are able to more and more align their shopping habits to their own values. As we become more and more aware of the environmental harms that are surrounding us, as well as the, the social injustices that are happening in our world, the fact that we can be more empowered to uh, make decisions that impact all of these through our purchasing decisions really um, enables people to, to feel better about uh, what they are doing. So. I think it's very critical where people can align their values to how they shop, but also, as has been touched upon, there is the economic potential benefit um, that people can get from uh, maybe accessing goods that are more efficient or, or goods that have uh, lower costs because of um, uh, other benefits. If we're shifting around uh, supply chains, maybe connecting consumers more directly to producers, uh, there can be lower costs in that respect. But also then there's the, the long-term benefits. So as well as um, uh, reducing the, the, the impact on the environment, minimizing uh, the risks of climate change, there is longer term 
uh, health benefits uh, through less pollution, less wastage and, and so on, which are all sort of coming together, all of these benefits coming together to support consumers in the long term and enable them and inspire them now uh, more and more to, to purchase more sustainably. Thanks, Peter. And I think uh, we'll try with Agustin now. Perhaps you can uh, connect with us. Yes, thank you. I had uh, trouble to unmute when I was working. Um, I would like to pick up on something that Anil had raised um, at the beginning. And I very much agree that um, actually when we talk about benefits, we need to take a very broad perspective. But when it comes to the to the green transition, as, as, as we call it, or developing a more sustainable um, economy and society, this has become really a matter of survival at the, at the end of the day. Um, uh, we are in a crisis, and it's not like an economic crisis that will pass. It's a crisis that is here to stay. So the question is how we can mitigate the negative effects of that crisis that have been caused, basically, by the way uh, we produce, uh, we distribute goods, um, we, we consume uh, as well, certainly. And, and in this regard, um, I think that making the green transition attractive to consumers and to businesses um, is fundamental to attain that goal of developing a more sustainable economy, which at the end, this transition has become an end in itself. Um, and I think this is very important to, to bear in mind because we're going to succeed only if um, we will make the different sectors uh, of the economy change the way they, they produce and help consumers and empower consumers to be able to, con to consume uh, and to make decisions in a, in a more informed and, and conscious manner. Um, there, have been a, um, there was a very interesting article a couple of years ago that was called the elusive green consumer. And it is basically about um, why um, consumers express so much concern about the environment and the impact on consumption on the environment. But when they act, those uh, actions do not reflect those concerns. And of course, there are many reasons to, to, to explain this. Um, and one, we need to think uh, about the incentives that the governments, in our case, the European Union, for example, will have to create both for companies and businesses in order to be able to develop a more sustainable, a more sustainable economy. Um, so I think it's extremely, extremely important to think about um, the, creating the right incentives um, in order to attain that goal. Thank you. Thanks, Augustine. I think that's that's very nice insight. Uh, Claire, would you like to go share something next? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, well, a lot has already been, been said. Um, so let me give an illustration of how we're looking at this at Amazon. As far as we are concerned, we're absolutely committed to sustainability for all the reasons that you highlighted. We co-founded the Climate Pledge two years ago. This is a commitment to reach net zero carbon by 2040, which is very ambitious. Um, this is 10 years before the target from the Paris Agreement. And to achieve this target, we are investing in a huge range of projects um, that will help us um, in, in, in that way. And I think a good example that can illustrate the link between these investments and the transition to sustainable consumption, which is the, the theme from this workshop, is the launch of our climate pledge friendly program in 2020. This is a program that helps customers to easily discover and identify products on our website that have more um, one or more certifications that help to protect the natural world. So this is quite powerful. This is really about raising awareness of these products, which I think is something that uh, Marta highlighted. And, and we find that this is something that customers really value. Um, in Europe, our customers can, can shop more than 100,000 climate pledge friendly products across a range of categories, um, across grocery households, um, fashion, beauty, etc. So, so that's, I think, a very concrete example of how we can enable this uh, transition to sustainable consumption. Thanks a lot, and I, I think uh, many of you have, have talked about the um, education and, and consumer behavior and consumer choices online, and, and also some of you mentioned the, the discrepancy between uh, the declarations consumers make about um, um, having sustainable, um, uh, acting sustainably, and, uh, and, uh, and their actual choice, and, and maybe perhaps Magic could say about anything about this from the perspective of 
of consumer complaints we, we receive at, at the office? So actually, we don't get many complaints on these issues. Uh, this, uh, well, Polish consumers probably, for the Polish consumers, the, the, the sustainability of products and, and traders is not yet uh, a very important issue. It's rather a niche. Uh, for um, and uh, obviously it's also um, um, a place for for developments and uh, and this is where where we as the office of uh, competition and uh, consumer protection we see our role also to educate to 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 um, to, to to empower consumers and uh, and uh, and try to to, to create a a friendly environment uh, for for the consumers to uh, uh, for, for the future. Yes, exactly. And so I think um, I think it all really boils down to um, to awareness, to behavior, and to choice. Uh, and I think this is uh, precisely why it's so interesting to to tackle sustainable behavior and sustainable consumption choices in the um, digital in the context of digital environment so this is uh, why now I, I would like that we all think about uh, how the uh, e environment and the digital environment influences our sustainable behavior uh, and to think in, in what way it has a positive impact impact in, in what way it is uh, it is an opportunity to now transition to uh, to more sustainable behavior um, what is so particular about the uh, digital environment uh, that uh, can help us and is an opportunity for us to uh, to move to um, to try and consume consume more sustainably uh, and on the other hand what are the what are the risks so what are the uh, possible ne negative impacts on on uh, consumer uh, sustainable consumer behavior online um, we'll be uh, writing down all of your ideas. Uh, Carol uh, here will be uh, trying to keep track of everything and uh, later we'll, we'll, we'll share that for you so that you can see a little bit the outcome of this brainstorming. Um, and uh, anybody is, uh, is free to, to speak up? Yes, sure, go ahead. Uh, my name is Asim Adi. And uh, I've been working in uh, ICT sector for quite long. Uh, I'm an IT consultant. Particularly, I have seen that transition in the retail market uh, during the pandemic, the e-commerce market just skyrocketed uh, 4 trillion straight. And now we see that e-commerce market will increase more and more. It is also developing a habit of us that now we feel very easy. We have the mobile apps and whenever we want something, we just search out, we filter and see, compare the prices and we just order. Uh, if we compare with the retail market and e-commerce market behavior in the physical retail market domain, the cost of operating for the producers was very high for the brands to manage to infrastructure and everything. In the e-commerce store, the cost is low, that is why the prices in the e-commerce market are low. And that is also adding to higher consumption. But the actual question comes here is that not only the consumption that how much we are purchasing, but every time when we are purchasing, there's a packaging material coming with that. And we are creating a lot of uh, trash with that. So maybe we should also think about it that we reduce that packaging material. It will also help us in the economically to reduce the cost of those uh, goods which we are receiving. It will be economical for the buyer and as well as for the seller to, to store it. That's, uh, I think, I, I would like to say. Thank you. I think this is a really excellent point because on one hand you mentioned the fact that uh, it's easier for consumers to compare and perhaps this gives this is a little bit of a tool which which facilitates a little bit or should be able to support sustainable behavior but on the other hand you do mention that uh, that the switch online uh, is uh, lowering prices and perhaps that barrier between uh, for for consumer between you know making the choice shopping making the choice uh, 
is a little bit lower and, and, then, uh, and then we tend to consume more, not just because of the price also, but perhaps because it's, it's just also easier to buy and, and to have it sent directly to my, to my place. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really excellent point, yeah. Uh, Nils, would you like to go next? Yes, thanks a lot, uh, Martina. I think this question now really leads us to the crunch of the issue we are discussing today. And I think it's great that you are putting the, the green and the digital transition and the interlinkages between those two transitions uh, at the heart of our discussion. And indeed, uh, of course, the digital transition offers a lot of opportunities in terms of uh, greener consumption. Some have been uh, raised already now. Uh, yes, online, we often have a broader choice of products and services, and therefore we may be able to go as consumers for the greener products. Yes, we also might find better information about the environmental aspects of the products and services. Um, and uh, also for, for innovative companies uh, via the, the online sales channels, they have the possibility not just to sell in their backyard, uh, let's say in the near physical proximity, but really sell good, innovative green products throughout the union and even beyond. At the same time, there are significant pitfalls um, in, uh, let's say, this interlinkage between the green and the digital transition. Uh, first, uh, already to run the e-commerce, you, you have a heavy IT infrastructure, which consumes a lot of energy in itself. And then if we are ordering individual products, you have the problem of the logistics, which cause a lot of environmental impact. And you have indeed the individual uh, packaging, which already was referred to. And let's say we also see at the union level, when we are digging into this interlinkage, that we are clearly not there yet. Recently, we did an analysis together with national authorities on green claims or so information about the environmental characteristics of products used in the online environment. And more than 50% of the green claims we looked at did not comply with the most basic requirements in terms of sending a clear message, being based on, on data, following a clear methodology, et cetera. So there was heavy green washing and a confusion of consumers happening. And I think, let's say this question, whether we will come to synergies between the digital and the green transition, or whether the two will go in wrong, opposite directions, for me is still an open question. It's not a given that the digital transition will contribute to the green transition. It could go in the wrong direction. And I think we need to, we talked already a bit about rules, perhaps we can deepen that a bit. Yes, we need clear rules for the actors uh, in the, the online market. At the same time, online players like, like Amazon, and we have Claire here, have a huge influence because even if you go on those kind of uh, online places, we know that consumers are easily influenced. They're nudged into decisions. And now the question is, if a consumer looks for a product on an online marketplace, what products will be then proposed to the consumer? Because the consumer might not go for the first choice. It will go perhaps for the second or the third one. So which products then are pushed to the consumer? Therefore, the, the data use of, the, of the, the consumer, the role of the platforms is critical. So again, let's say just to, to make the, the point, um, how those two transitions will work to, to, together, let's say in a symbiotic, positive way, or in a conflictual, negative way, for me, really is an open question. I think this, this, these are very good insights and, and you mentioned uh, uh, also very important points, just uh, greenwashing and the role of, of, of platforms. And um, before perhaps we, we can uh, give Claire also something to say about this, uh, we, we can also give the floor to Agustin. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> very briefly, actually, I totally agree with, uh, with you, Nils. Um, the, the green trans, the, the digital transition or the digital environment in which we are living can offer opportunities, like you say, for example, introducing appropriate um, green nudges, you know, helping consumers to go towards the more sustainable options, but can also go in the in the wrong direction. And I think we are already seeing that. Um, as we know, um, e-commerce has made uh, shopping very, very easy. And that also meant a huge opportunity for, for companies to create basically needs and create wants. So that has stimulated at the end of the day overconsumption with all the consequences that we are seeing, you know, emissions, uh, increase of emissions due to um, distribution, shipping from very, very far away, 
uh, products and and and, um, and goods, um, and the increase of of waste packaging. You all have mentioned uh, several several um, negative um, negative externalities of this of, of e-commerce. Um, but here, what I think it's very very important to to think about is, um, as I say before, what are the incentives that we are going to make? You know, both uh, not only an economic level but also non-economic for the companies in order to actually help help consumers to uh, correct their consumption uh, behavior in a in a in a certain way, and and the fact that we are seeing so many misleading green claims is something extremely problematic because as I said before. Consumers are very sensitive about the climate crisis, and that also can play in the hands of companies that might be able to exploit that uh, with just simply profiting um, purposes, and, and therefore undermine the trust that consumers might have in uh, future um, and genuine environmental claims. So I think that this is um, uh, something very important to, to bear in mind, also the level of enforcement. As, uh, as Ms. mentioned, we need uh, new rules, we need clear rules, but also we need to enforce what we have. Uh, and, and, and in this regard, it was really, really alarming to see the result of the SWIFT uh, exercise. Thank you. Thanks, Agustin. Perhaps our panelists here on site, uh, Marta? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. So I would like to refer to what was already uh, said about the fact that what stands behind uh, e-commerce is an uh, amazing amount of, uh, of equipment. Yeah, so when we calculate it, it's more than 200 million tons. And if we compare it to the country, the carbon footprint it causes is two or three times bigger than France, for example. So it is huge. It is one of the minuses of uh, e-commerce and digital uh, consumption. Uh, on the other hand, when we talk about greenwashing, we are saying what companies say to the consumers and that consumers get, inform from, get information from the sources like companies, like universities, like official sites. But, but what really happens is uh, more than 75%, according to our research, 75% uh, consumers uh, really uh, value the fact that they can join um, online communities, that they can join uh, Facebook sites and read about digital consumption from there. So what we really shall talk about is also the um, it's also the quality of information they, they get and if there is any control over what they read because it's really amazing power and it is actually the, an advantage that consumers can share uh, their experience that uh, the, this this power of crowd yeah the crowd sourcing but on the other hand who controls what they share so sometimes it might be a very good experience, but sometimes it might be something wrong, like the fake news, and there is no control over that. And what is the influence of that on sustainable consumption or the opposite, uh, the opposite of it? So I think this is also a pretty important issue here. Thank you. Thanks, Marta. Maciek, go ahead. Uh, yes, I'd like to, to, to develop some more on this, on this issue that um, e-commerce requires companies to get fully um, sustainable. You cannot be, be partially sustainable if you want to sell online because uh, uh, consumers will instantly unveil uh, all, all the greenwashing that, that, uh, that is in place. And uh, um, from my perspective, the, 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 the power of, of making a comment on Facebook is huge for, for consumers. And, and, uh, um, and so they can, they can easily um, show uh, that companies are not sustainable, in fact, even if they claim to be sustainable. Thank you, Maciek. And uh, I think, uh, Peter Andrews, you, um, you have the floor now. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, I, I, we believe that online shopping has the potential to be less damaging to the environment than traditional in-store shopping. 
Um, but that is only if we do it right. Um, and all stakeholders really need to make concrete steps to ensure that the sustainability opportunities of e-commerce are grasped and the potential sustainability pitfalls are avoided. Now we've touched upon a number of different areas. I think one of the ones that is really shining through is that a lack of information or lack of adequate information is one of the key barriers stopping consumers from adopting more sustainable lifestyles. Now we know that um, more and more claims are being made uh, by all types of different businesses around sustainability. Sustain they know consumers are much more interested in this issue um, and, and therefore um, businesses are taking advantage of this. And one example in the past four years, the number of clothes and accessories described as sustainable has quadrupled among online retailers in the US and the UK. And they're using terms such as vegan, conscious and eco, but without always sufficient back into what exactly that means. Now, where consumers become aware of um, uh, particular issues that uh, conflict with those uh, claims, they start to lose trust in the marketplace. And that lack of trust has a big negative impact on, on the sustainability, particularly of brands that are trying, uh, brands and businesses that are trying to do the right thing in providing um, robust uh, sustainable products to, to consumers. So we've got a real effort to focus on here, and that does require all actors to play a role, businesses, governments, policymakers, standard setting bodies, as well as consumers and consumer organizations to play a role. Thanks a lot, Peter. Um, so I think now we'll, we'll move to Claire because we have uh, spoken a, a lot about the, the role of the um, of online market marketplaces in the way they, uh, on the one hand, um, you know, Peter, for example, has been more optimistic than, than Niels in terms of saying that uh, uh, the, the, the shift to digital marketplaces is, is perhaps an opportunity for, uh, for um, supporting consumers to, to consume more sustainably. Um, but also everybody from our panelists, I think, agrees that uh, um, uh, online marketplaces have a very important role to play here in, in the way that they uh, um, uh, filter through, through all the offers that are available um, uh, online. and. Uh, and uh, have also a little bit of control over, over the claims you're making. Um, and at the same time, um, uh, allow a, a platform also for, for consumers to, to be able to choose, to select, and then also control their systems that make the suggestions to, to consumers. So Claire, go ahead and tell us what you think about this. Thank you. Well, I think I'm also on the optimistic side. So um, building on what Peter said, we also believe that e-commerce represents a great opportunity to actually lower the carbon emissions associated with retail. So this is one of the, the key conclusions from a recent study led by Oliver Wyman in collaboration with the University of St. Gallen, which shows that um, buying a product online results in 2.3 times less emissions of CO2 equivalent as buying in a physical store. Um, so that is actually um, very encouraging. But that being said, we also recognize the challenges associated with online retail. So this is something we need to be humbled about. I think one of the participants mentioned packaging. So um, I, I can um, talk about it a little bit, um, if that's OK. We, we are really working hard to improve the sustainability of our packaging. That's one thing, but also to reduce the amount of packaging that we use. And I think that was also mentioned earlier by um, some of the other speakers. So just a few examples of how we're doing this. So we've invented machine learning algorithms to help us make the smartest packaging choice for customer orders. So this is something that our customers want, right? Um, they want to receive uh, their package in the right size, the recyclable packaging that will minimize waste on their end obviously, while ensuring that um, the delivery is, is damage-free. So that's one thing. We um, also launched a, a program called Frustration-Free Packaging in 2008. And this is to encourage manufacturers to package their products in a packaging that is ready to ship to customers without uh, the need for additional Amazon boxes or over-packaging. Um, this, is, this is really important. And 
just to give you an example um, of what it looks like, basically, this is um, something I um, received yesterday. Um, I ordered it on Amazon and I received it like this in my mailbox. So as you can see, there's no over packaging. And I think this is really the direction that we want to take. So today um, we have about 2 million products that are already available through this program. But you know, what we're doing really is working hard with our vendors like Philips, Hasbro to, to redesign their packaging. So there's a lot of work that needs to be um, that needs to be done. As I said, we need to be very humble about it. But um, overall, I think um, we are on the optimistic side um, that there are things we can do. Uh, thanks a lot. I, I think Niels, you, you would like to take the floor again. Yes, thanks a lot. Sorry for coming in again. But I think it's not a question of being pessimistic and optimistic. Uh, and that is uh, something I would like really to, to insist on. I don't consider myself to be a pessimistic. My point is in which direction this interlinkage between the digital and the green transition will evolve is open. And we should not take it for granted that the e-commerce, which clearly will grow significantly after the pandemic, and we are not through the pandemic, it will continue growing. Not necessarily in a black and white matter that you have uh, pure online shops and pure physical shops. It will even intertwine more, which I think is a healthy development. But online e-commerce is the growing trend of the future. There's no question about it and there are huge opportunities. But how this interlinks with the sustainable choices is an open question and we should not take anything for granted. Let me give you two examples. One is if you buy shoes in a normal brick and mortar shop, you will try different sizes, you will walk with the shoes, and then you go for the right shoes which match your feet. Online, you will order several sizes, and we are wrestling with the problem, what happens with the products which are sent back then to the trader? That's a massive problem, uh, even if the products sent back to the trader are not thrown away, which happens in some cases, you still have the sending back and forth. The second point, and there again, the role of the platforms is very important. We want consumers to make a conscious choice for the green products. If you go for, let's say, a comparison website done, for example, by a consumer organization, the consumer organization will inject the knowledge they have about the environmental characteristics of the product, the reparability, the use of chemicals, etc., into their comparison website. But this kind of rather complex comparison of products cannot be done by an online platform. So then the question, what kind of products are promoted on the online platform become very important. So just two examples to show there is a lot of, uh, let's say, work to be done to make sure that this huge potential of the online commerce is also delivering on our green ambitions. No, Nils, I think I, I also agree with you totally. I think it's, it's a matter of um, we are now at a stage where we have the opportunity perhaps to, to, to make the best of it and to really, I mean, it's, it's not a, a, something we should take for granted. It's a, it's a transi transition stage. It's a development stage where we can take the opportunity to use the synergy between uh, um, sustainable development and, and, uh, and uh, uh, the shift to um, e-commerce. And uh, it's a little bit, it's actually up to us how, how we'll make it and how we'll steer that development. So we should definitely identify, uh, I think, the, the threats and the risks and, and uh, try to mitigate them and at the same point make the best of the opportunities that, that uh, this, this kind of dual transition offers. Um, well, I would try. I would like to sh shift uh, soon to, to discussing uh, the, um, the the perspective of the consumers and, and how empowered you feel in, in shopping online and, and what, what are your problems in terms of sustainable consumption online. Uh, but uh, but I think I will just give a word to our panelists uh, so so the audience can think about uh, as, as, about about this question as consumers. Marta, go ahead. Uh, yes, so uh, the reason I, I wanted to add something here is uh, because I, I felt inspired that um, 
we don't only talk anymore about business to business here. We also talk about consumer to consumer. And what digitalization gave us is this uh, floor for sharing economy to grow. And uh, this is also a huge advantage of digitalization that consumers not anymore buy only new products. What they have uh, huge access to is the second uh, secondhand products. And they um, the, the quality of the products is really high. And we talk about all types of products in case of sharing economy. What they share is not only clothes, cars, their flats. This is also what minimizes the, the, the consumption. So we, we, we see here what is really sustainable, the deconsumption. Yeah? Consumers can share. And what companies observe is that, um, that the, the, this trend is growing. And I think this is one of the reasons why, for example, IKEA or Decathlon opened, um, Decathlon opened last, uh, last week or two weeks ago in Poland, the um, online shop, which is focused focused mainly on second-hand uh, decathlon uh, clothes and accessories. So you can sell what you are not using anymore and other consumers can buy it. So we see how the markets interact and how, uh, how dynamically it, uh, it changes. And I think this, uh, this is also a huge power of digitalization in terms of... Uh yeah, sustainability. You're exactly right, and I think one of our chat participants has, has made a similar point. Uh, William, I don't know whether you would like to say something online or whether uh, everybody else, else can refer to his, to his message on the chat. He, he mentions also the fact that digitalization, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, you have also said this here, right? That it's, it's not, and, and Marta, right? It's not just about the business, it's not just about the consumers, but also the businesses. The businesses have, a, have an opportunity to change their business models to uh, to focus more on, on sharing economy and, and circular economy, uh, as William here on the chat says, because we have those digital tool, tools um, that uh, uh, that are available when, when we are moving our businesses online. So this is also definitely something that we should uh, consider as an uh, opportunity. Um, yes, absolutely. I, if you want, I can say something on this. Unfortunately, I can't share my video. Sure, go ahead. Um, but uh, effectively, what, what I'm thinking is we have far more clothes than we actually need. So we could probably reduce the number of, of clothing items that we produce and use every day by, um, by two thirds, possibly, because for example, I have um, we have a lot of clothing items that spend most of the year in the closet. So why don't we think about business models that that um, use the or during the time that we that we have these clothes in the closet, we actually sell them or rent them out to other people to use in other areas of the world. Um, now we would need to perform a more detailed analysis on um, what the environmental benefit. Or we would need to. Um, compare the the um the cost of, of shipping these items as compared to the number of items items saved but i think there's um there's a great opportunity here thanks william and i think i think that's also a good point thanks for sharing that uh with us and on the chat augustin go ahead for a quick word ah, thank you um just to pick up something that was said um, in the previous session and and i think that links um, nicely with this discussion. Um, of course, we have to be optimistic. There is no other, other choice. Um, but we also need to be realistic and pragmatic. And the reality is that e-commerce has increased and led to the increase of consumption. Uh, it's much easier to buy online than offline. That's a reality. And we have to cope with it. And on the point, for example, on, on returns um, that have led to, um, to, higher, uh, to higher emissions, Emission. We cannot forget that this has become a business model. It has nothing to do with the existence of a right of withdrawal, although that I have, we have heard in the past many problems around it. But this is a business model. Companies, you know, out of you know, their, their, their own will and, and interest, offer this to consumers because consumers buy it. They offer free returns. They even send you a package of clothes that you have not asked for, so you can try them and send them back. So it's basically have created uh, business models around uh, around free um, uh, free free returns. Um, so of course, if you look at okay, how then we can counter that? How do we make consumers aware of um, the, the the negative effects of um, of um, uh, of, uh, of free returns or, 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 or these type of business models? For example, 
uh, one option is, of course, um, to try to make consumers aware of the cost, the environmental costs of uh, returns. And there are some examples already in the market. For example, there is a company, a shoemaker called All Birds, that they basically uh, try to conscientize people uh, not only about the conditions in which their products are being, being produced, but also, for example, what implies uh, in terms of emissions, you know, sending a, a product to a certain place. So I think this type of practices make consumers more aware and that will help them ultimately to think twice at the time of, of um, um, returning, or returning a good. And a second point that was mentioned in this session relates to C2C commerce. And of course, this is one of the areas where digitalization can bring opportunities for consumers because you might have a lot of stuff um, piled up in your, in your house that could be of use for somewhere else. So certainly um, stimulating C2C commerce, um, it's something that it's of course on, on the interest of, um, uh, of the environment because uh, one pair of shoes, clothes, or whatever electronics that you have at home that you could sell to somebody else, that means one less product being bought a new one and therefore produce. So I think this is something that we also need to bear, bear in mind. And I would love to hear, for example, from uh, from Claire, you know, how Amazon for example, will, will approach the question of um, creating secondhand markets within the platform itself. Thank you. Thanks. So, so now let's just make a quick exercise, everybody, and let's just put the consumer cap on. Uh, because we are all in different roles here and, and, uh, and we are all concerned in a different way professionally uh, in, in, in terms of uh, consumer, consumer protection and, and, uh, and e-commerce, but we are also all consumers. So, so let's just uh, everybody will think about what, how do you feel, how empowered do you feel when you shop online? Um, how empowered do you feel to shop sustainably? What, what, what kind of obstacles do you perceive and what kind of... Uh, um, behavioral effect of uh, the, the shift to digital environment do you perceive on your own behavior? I don't know if anybody would like to say something. Go ahead, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to say, like, just uh, as we were discussing before, that digital market has brought us uh, many benefits and uh, different aspects of it. Uh, we are also at a stage where, where we can uh, see the whole supply chain that how traceable and trackable it is. Uh, there can be an idea just like we have uh, uh, on the products which work with the uh, energy. So we see that how much energy they consume. Just like we can enforce the same model on all other producers as well, even for the producers of cloth, that what are the environmental effects of that. Uh, just like we can see on the products, eatable uh, products that, okay, how many calories it, it has and all that. So maybe that kind of a formula uh, will create more awareness for the buyers. Uh, that also is helping the impact-based e-commerce market because we can see that these small impact-based e-commerce markets are also emerging, which are producing very organic and all that. So there are uh, positive awareness is required and also there is uh, more knowledge to be published in online material uh, that will help. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think we can use those, uh, those um, online tools or perhaps use the digital environment to help consumers uh, understand better their choices to, to perhaps make them more aware of what they're bu buying, of the environmental impact that they're buying, perhaps also for them uh, more comparison. Um, but still, uh, th th this is, this is the, there is the issue of the discrepancy between how we, what we declare, right? As, as Maciek said, here in Poland, we don't receive that many uh, consumer complaints on, on um, for example, uh, green claims that are misleading to consumers. Uh, but yet we hear a lot uh, in Poland, uh, we hear a lot uh, a big debate also on um, consuming sustainably, and there is quite a lot of awareness going on, I think, uh, among our NGOs and, and civil society and, and all, all the other groups about this issue. Um, but for some reason, uh, consumers are st still not, not aware, or this doesn't really necessarily translate to actual choices. Uh, so there is this kind of strange behavioral phenomenon uh, of, of human choice. Um, which is perhaps something that that uh, that we we should also try and tackle. Um, I don't know if anybody else would like to share their their view on on what else as a consumer they would like to see. Yeah, go ahead. 
Thank you um, for the record. This is Elisabeth Schauermann from the German Informatics Society. And I just had to think about a hackathon that we did a few months ago, where young people um, uh, programmed a plugin, a browser plugin, that basically when you enter any kind of online shop, um, asks you if you really want to buy this thing, and then you can postpone actually clicking the buying button to later. But I think what that does, or what the people who are aware of, of such solutions are already um, sensitized to the overall issue. So um, I think in terms of, of reaching a lot of people, there still has a lot to be done um, from not only from activists or, or programmers who, who do such things, but um, more so from, I don't know, general policy making also the, although it contradicts their, um, their market idea to sell a lot of things, maybe also from the, the e-commerce companies themselves. Thanks a lot, and, and it's a great point. I, I think I really like two points that you made. One is that, so, so perhaps one of the problems is that uh, shopping online is so easy that we just go ahead and shop, and we even, this barrier between actual shopping and spending money is decreasing, so it's much easier for us to shop even though, uh, with, with a little bit of a less of an awareness even that we are buying something, because it's so easy, it's just one click, right? Uh, so, so that's one thing, um, and uh, and I think that's that's also a good point to mention, uh, and and we'll perhaps try to tackle it later on, uh, in terms of uh, what's in it for the on online marketplaces, uh, because shopping sustainably or or not deciding not to buy means loss of profit uh, for the companies. But this is a discussion we'll, we'll take on later. Um, and we'll move now perhaps to the discussion part with, with Carol. Uh, we'll talk about uh, what can different actors do and, and what is the, the way to share the responsibilities. Go ahead, Carol. Thank you, um, Martina. I'm very happy that we, we have established that the e-commerce is, uh, or it should be considered as a, a bridge between the digitalization and making the economy more sustainable. And uh, those transitions uh, to the greener one, to the better one, more sustainable one, demands actors uh, to play uh, certain roles. And uh, those actors are, of course, consumers, are, of course, business. But as we can see, our panelists, those are uh, also the um, university, representatives or consumers uh, or organizations and of course uh, the most important uh, initiators of the um, sustainable uh, ideas which is the European uh, Commission and uh, my uh, question as Martina said uh, is uh, how much action should we expect from uh, both uh, or uh, from uh, uh, particular actors um, on this uh, on this playground? And uh, I, I would start uh, from uh, the European Commission, uh, from the NILS. And my question is, uh, what uh, is uh, your um, responsibility and why do you think it, it is the most important one. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Carol. Let's say from a point of view of, of the policy makers, I think we need to find the right balance between a regulated environment, which let's say sets a framework in which fair and let's say innovative competition takes place. And at the same time, the right measure of empowerment to consumers that still have a crucial role with their personal purchasing decisions. And indeed, Martina, you made a good point. Sometimes not to buy is the best choice you may want to do. Uh, so let's say that the consumer still have a very important role. For us, it's very important that we are not imposing a certain lifestyle. We don't want to restrict uh, in any way how consumers are, let's say, purchasing, are taking decisions about their own uh, way of, of living. But at the same time, it's important that, for example, we um, have rules in place that concern the um, environmental aspects of products. Just an example, the reparability. One major, uh, let's say, uh, product that impacts our personal footprint are the smartphones. 
And if the smartphones cannot be repaired, then our footprint will be worse. So we want to make sure that there are rules in place that make sure that you can repair a smartphone, that you have the software updates, that you can replace the battery, etc. So you need rules on the products that are circling in the single market. And we also believe as Europeans that we should use the power of the single market to make sure that really um, products which are not complying with a minimum standard of environmental perform performance should not even go onto the market so that consumers are not even confronted with this choice. But that's only one part. And the other part, of course, is really empowering the consumer. And there we need, it's mainly the question about the information that we need to get, uh, get right. Um, and that's something where we are working on. Uh, in different areas of the commission, but also at, at national level to make sure that consumers get the right information in terms of label. We talked about a label before. What kind of label can we put forward? What kind of information? How can we protect consumers about unfair trading practices, which sometimes happen also in the e-commerce? So I would say that's um, our perspective from a policymaker point of view. Thank you very much, Niels. I can agree that uh, cl uh, clear rules are very important, and I can say that uh, your um, speech was very interesting. And this time, uh, uh, now I would uh, switch to uh, Agustin, probably. Uh, what is your uh, opinion about your responsibility as a um, European consumer organization? Thank you, thank you, Carol. Um, so indeed, we are an advocacy group. Um, what we want ultimately is that the decision, um, the decision makers at, at, at European level, um, ensure that, let's say, consumers are are empowered, uh, that the right incentives are created for the companies to offer more sustainable products and business models to, to consumers, and that consumers go for it. Um, so here we need to look, as I said before, to economic and non-economic incentives. Uh, when I say non-economic incentives, think about um, legislation, what are the rules that we need in place uh, to attain this, this objective. And there are basically um, three important points that I think it worth uh, mentioning, also in light of what Niels has just explained. So first, um, we need to ensure, of course, that consumers have the right information but we need also to ensure, most important, that this information is meaningful at the end of the day and help consumers genuinely uh, to make uh, informed, sustainable choices. Here we are very much looking for, for example, the empowerment uh, in the green transition proposal um, that, um, that is foreseen uh, early, early next year, um, the green claims uh, proposal as well, which should uh, be able to address the important deficiency that we have uh, in the context of um, environmental green claims um, currently have shown in the, in the SWIFT exercise. Then a second very important um, uh, group of policies is we need to ensure that companies produce in a more sustainable manner, which includes also producing more durable and long lasting products, as well as the waste disposal. So there are different policies that go basically hand, uh, hand in hand. Here, um, the, the European uh, Commission is, uh, is busy working on its proposal for a sustainable product in initiative um, how in the context of um, consumer law, which is kind of a, a, a remit of, a, of, a, of, of work uh, in relation to the role of guarantee rights we play, the right to repair, uh, so here, there are many, many policy areas that come together in order to attain these, um, these goals. And then the final um, group of priorities, I would say, relates to enforcement. And uh, the European Union is well known for having very good laws in place historically, but where we fail massively is on its enforcement. The different reason for this, that we don't need to go in detail, but a clear, um, a clear goal is to step up on the enforcement of the rules that, that, that we have. Um, ensure that you know, we create precedence about what is allowed and what is not in, in our single market and, and at the end of the day. And that does not include only enforcement against um, environmental, um, misleading environmental claims or the enforcement of the UCPD, which still is very important, but also enforcement to ensure that dangerous products 
unsafe products and unsustainable products do not reach our markets. Uh, and this is something that, that needs mention. And as we know, many of these products come from outside the European Union. That creates a problem, not only for consumers, but also for European companies that want to play by the rules. Uh, so here we also need to think about developing a, a level playing field for European companies that are, are compliant. And in this regard, uh, of course, a challenge will, will be how to ensure that uh, these uh, unsafe products that arrive mostly in individual parcels uh, cannot reach the, um, the, the EU or if they reach that are conforming with uh, our standards. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Agustin. Uh, uh, I can agree that uh, sustainability, sustainability is um, uh, on the EU policy uh, agenda quite important. And uh, you m made me call out uh, the uh, business uh, representatives, uh, which is Claire from Amazon. Claire, do you have something to say? Um, uh, after those two speeches uh, about the responsibilities of uh, particular actors in this uh, market. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I think we all have a role to play and recognizing this role, being humble about it, um, and also being rigorous in how we approach these this challenges and this role, it's, it's very important. We are a customer-centric company, so our role is to give our customers the solutions that will enable them to shop online in a sustainable way. So, you know, whether this is by working on packaging, as I already mentioned, or through this climate pledge friendly program that helps them to identify products that have certain um, environmental certifications. So that's one piece. We are also using our size and our scale to serve as a catalyst sending signals um, to the industry to drive a faster transition to a low carbon economy. And this is very important, for example, when it comes to accelerating the transition to zero emission transportation, for example, um, talking here about electric vehicles, for example, or hydrogen. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, I think uh, I can move to my colleague from the office, Maciej, I know him uh, quite uh, a long time, and I know that, that he has uh, uh, quite um, uh, quite strong opinions about uh, some kind of uh, business um, practices, uh, or um, he can uh, say some, something, uh, uh, some uh, tips um, that he observes uh, about, for example, the last mile thing. Um, Maciej, uh, can you say something more about your uh, observations uh, uh, regarding the uh, making the e-commerce more greener and more sustainable? Yes, I think that uh, that um, the good thing about e-commerce is that it has a huge potential of um, of um, reducing its uh, carbon footprint. We have been discussing uh, before uh, whether. Uh, whether e-commerce uh, has a um, bigger uh, carbon fo footprint than uh, than traditional uh, shopping, uh, studies differ uh, on, uh, on this uh, on this issue. Uh, so, uh, what is certain is that that a good organiz uh, organization of deliveries can can uh, reduce uh, this uh, this carbon footprint and. Uh, make the, uh, the, the e-commerce more uh, sustainable. Uh, I'm talking um, here about the role of the local governments, uh, and uh, obviously there is also a, a, a place for, for legislation in that area, but, but, um, but there are also um, issues that can be solved on the local uh, level, uh, like organization of deliveries and uh, um, Organization, you know, um, uh, for example, if we switch to to delivering uh, uh, goods on the last mile uh, in uh, cargo bikes instead of vans, uh, we can reduce the carbon footprint of uh, of e-commerce by forty percent. So, so there is a, 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 um, a lot that can that can be quite easily achieved. Uh, 
um, Claire uh, also s uh, said about about reducing um, packaging. Uh, so that's another issue that that can be done, um, and that's more into into business or or, or on the side of of, of legislation. Uh, but but I wanted to uh, to to show and to to a point on the rule of uh, of good organization of deliveries on the side of local government. Uh, thank you, Maciej. Uh, uh, on your uh, left side, there is uh, Marta, who represents uh, my favorite university in Poland, which is U University of Economics in Katowice. And that university is uh, quite famous of its uh, uh, scientists and researchers. Uh, this is why uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, you are invited in here in this forum uh, because you have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, interesting things to say. So uh, I give you a floor. What is responsibility of uh, academia uh, to promote uh, or to create uh, the practices uh, that could uh, lead to uh, make transition? smoothly. Uh, thank you, Carol, very much for that uh, introduction. And I think uh, it is worth underlying that what we already said so far is how important it is that consumers are aware that consumers know how to, how to act, how to behave, and how uh, we can kind of influence them to be more sustainable. And uh, the role of universities around the globe is, uh, is really crucial here. And we, as University of Economics in Katowice, take our role very seriously. So how we see uh, our role in uh, making this transition smoothly is uh, threesome. So first of all, we do it through the research. Uh, and we have, as Carol already said, scientists who focus very much on um, on sustainable consumption from the different perspectives. And uh, what Martina said was that um, sometimes what consumers declare is different than what they do. This is why we do this research very, uh, in a very complex way. We don't focus only on what they say, we focus on what they really do. So we uh, un engage different types of, uh, of research. Uh, we focus um, very much on uh, how we can nudge them, so that uh, a famous um, Nobel Prize winner said, Thaler, we can actually nudge consumers to behave in, uh, in a better way. So uh, nudging works, it's, uh, it's from behavioral economy, um, and, and we try to discover how we really can kind of uh, guide them to become more sustainable. And the research in this context is crucial. Then what we do, and what is really important, is we educate. Uh, and um, on one hand, we try to encompass sustainability within the programs. So there is a sustainability course in each uh, either bachelor or, or master uh, program. Uh, we try to show cases in different courses. So we educate our students, but we, as I already mentioned at the beginning, we educate also the community around it. So uh, through the programs for, uh, uh, for, for kids, to the programs for uh, alumni, to the programs for, uh, for the community interested, we offer, them, uh, we offer them webinars, so in a digital form, but we also offer them different types of courses so they, they become more aware, they know, they can ask us questions and we, 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 we will let them know, but we also generally offer a free education for them, which is also, uh, also really important here and the role of universities uh, shall not be underestimated in this, uh, in this matter. And then finally, uh, and then finally, we take this role from the organizational point of view. So we believe that it's not only the fact that we stand in front of the students and tell them something. It's also through their policies, through their procedures, through their uh, the way the university operates on the market. So the fact that the website is um, 
uh, is inclusive for students with some disabilities, uh, for older generations, we, we offer that as well. We try to offer um, all types of sustainable solutions through the university. So like uh, free water dispensers, uh, which promote uh, sustainable, uh, uh, sustainable behavior. We promote uh, coming to the university by the bike. So it's maybe not digital, but it still promotes the uh, promotes how to behave sustainable in everyday actions because this is really what we are talking about we, we are talking about full transition so we have to believe it from the from the roots and university role in that is is really important thank you thank you marta for your statements and believe me or not i like your university even more <laughs> uh, and uh, i have noticed that uh, claire uh, has raised a hand and uh, Peter has raised a, a hand. So, ladies first, uh, Claire, I uh, give you a voice. Thank you. I, I will be brief. I just wanted to follow up quickly on the point that was made before about the last mile delivery, because I think it's, it's a very important aspect and one where businesses can have a very clear role to play. So there was a mention of um, electric vans and cargo bikes and all of this is great. We are um, definitely using them in, in many different cities across Europe and across the world. Um, just wanted to add that we are also experimenting with on-foot delivery. So we're you know, working with walkers to deliver. Um, this is obviously zero emission in different cities. So just to say that um, there's a lot we can do. We need to be creative. Um, and and that's, um, that's probably something that would apply to all of us in our different roles if we want to address the challenges um, of sustainable consumption effectively. Thank you very much, Claire. And uh, Peter, don't think that I have, uh, uh, that you are forgotten. Uh, you were supposed to uh, speak. Uh, so uh, I think you are the last speaker uh, in this session. So uh, it is your privilege to be uh, brief. And uh, please say uh, what you want to say as the last one. Thank you very much. Uh, very useful discussion so far. However, I think we've, we've, we've missed uh, an important uh, topic, and, and that is that um, as low and middle income countries are increasingly engaging with e-commerce and its impact, we need to look at the opportunity of making uh, this much more uh, it's making sustainability much more accessible and affordable to all, not just people in wealthy nations. So in developing countries, e-commerce businesses can help to provide a leapfrogging effect to modern, efficient value chains by aggregating consumer demand. And if we take food, the food system as an example, it's very complex, highly fragmented, especially in these developing countries, take dozens of stakeholders and transactions to to bring food from farmers to consumers and at each step there are these uh, transaction costs uh, that are incurred by all all of the business partners now e-commerce platforms can connect consumers and producers more directly that will reduce costs for consumers um, and and therefore make it a much more um, greater opportunity for them as well as reducing the environmental impact by making transport more efficient and promoting local uh, food uh, systems. There's a great example. So uh, Pinduoduo, founded in 2015, is a Chinese e-commerce platform that connects farmers with about 850 million consumers. Um, users are actively encouraged to um, uh, form teams to make purchases, giving farmers more visibility and assurance that they can move large quantities of produce in short period of time. Now, technology is used to forecast as well as aggregate that demand to ensure the optimal supply route. And the model is able to reduce the carbon footprint by about 40% by having the product go more directly from farmer to consumer. Um, so we need to be aware that e-commerce can bring these great opportunities to all countries, to all consumers, wherever they are. There's a really important thing that, uh, again, that um, I think we need to bring through that e-commerce is providing access to people that may not have had direct access to for, before to sustainable products, as well as products that will support their, their general well-being. Um, and so there are great opportunities, but um, as many have said, there are, there are big challenges that we all need to overcome and the many actors that are needed to, to drive that forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. It was a very great closing speech. 
because now we are closing our session and I will give the voice to Martina who will do the uh, closing speech, but from the moderator's side. No, thanks. I, I just wanted to... Uh, no, I, I also think it was a great discussion and, and I made in the meantime, uh, I will try to share uh, a, a summary uh, that we have... Uh, let me just see if I can do it. Um, okay, if I may be able to do it. I wanted to share a slide which I have um, uh, prepared with the summary of, of what we have discussed on um, threats and opportunities and I hope you can see it, right? Um, Okay, so so it's true that I mean we have sorry wrong I'll just leave it at this. So um, it's true that we have uh, um, it was a really nice discussion and we have looked at different threats and opportunities. But Peter, what you also mentioned, we have also uh, we didn't have time to look uh, at this issue more globally and to look into um, into the, the the perhaps a little bit more difficult situation or or, or a little bit. Uh, different types of problems that developing countries are uh, um, experiencing uh, in that aspect. Um, and, uh, you know, we have here representatives of, of uh, really uh, all over the globe here at the Internet Governance Forum. So uh, thanks for bringing this up here. We have also, um, we have tried also to, to also t talk a little bit about the digital sovereignty of consumers uh, online. And I think we managed to talk about this in terms of how consumers behave and, and how they Make their choices. Uh, it was it was Marta who, who made some really nice points on this. Um, uh, and uh, there is there is lots of different issues that that still need to be discussed here. And um, uh, it's it's a, obviously a huge huge uh, huge topic. Um, I really liked also the the point that uh, that Niels made and, and also Agustin made it. And I think everybody uh, here would agree that. Um, we need to take the matter in our hands uh, to to address the threats, uh, to um, to make use of the opportunities, uh, because it's up to us. And um, we made a quick round of. Uh, it's up to us to make uh, to support um, all actors, uh, whether these are uh, consumers, platforms, or businesses, uh, to uh, make uh, consumption more sustainable. Um, and uh, and we made a quick round on on how we we all should uh, should act, how different actors should should act, what what should be the role of the of the policymakers and enforcers, what should be the the role of of marketplaces, and uh, I'm pretty sure we will all um, have a little bit more. Um, this discussion uh, helped uh, helped us to to have those points a little bit more emphasized for each and every one of us. Um, so um, I think uh, for the last round, uh, as we are running out of time, uh, for the last round, I just would like to give everybody uh, one more time uh, uh, um, stage, uh, just to say perhaps your last piece of advice um, from your perspective on, uh, you can share the, the, the one uh, good practice, for example, that you, that you think uh, we could, that would be the takeaway from, from today's session uh, on how to make uh, uh, consumption uh, in the e-commerce environment more sustainable. And perhaps I will start with Niels. Well, thanks a lot, Martina. That's a difficult one, <laughs> just in, in one point. But I would say, um, let's say, look out for what information source you trust. That's what I would suggest. Thanks a lot. And, and that was nice and brief. And I think to stay in our mind. Um, Agustin, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Indeed, a, a difficult, difficult <laughs> question. Uh, I will go one step before. And I think that first of all, we need to have a common understanding about what is the problem. Where are the problems? What are the practices? Um, that um, are related to, to e-commerce that are most problematic in order to be able to define um, uh, the, the appropriate solutions. Uh, so I think that we, even if we see the negative effects of, uh, um, of overconsumption um, online, we still, I think, need to, to really define and nail down what are the specific problems that we need to tackle. 
So I think that's going to be my um, yeah my my, my final uh, my final work. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, maybe our panelists here on site, uh, Marta, you want to go next? Sure. So I would say um, educate, be be uh, curious, and you can educate through some online channels. You can join the universities like ours through different programs. As I said, we have those for different uh, stakeholders. Uh, you can join our executive education about sustainability uh, leader. So just educate so you will know where are the uh, where are the sources of information that are trustful. Thank you. Maciek, go ahead. Yes, I will continue. Um, so get as much information on the products and on the firms that, 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 uh, that, you, that you can before, before buying. And, uh, and also remember that uh, there is always an option of not buying, which might be better in certain situations. Uh. Okay, then uh, I'll return to the last two panelists uh, online uh, before I also pose the question to the audience uh, because we should still have a few more minutes for that. Um, go ahead, Peter. Thank you. I'll, I'll echo what um, everyone has said. I think also um, <clears throat> one of the things that we can do to, to build a more sustainable marketplace for everyone is to make sure that the marketplace is, is regulated in, in the most effective way. And that uh, to get to that point, we need policy making that is done in consultation with businesses, with civil society, and importantly with consumer organizations and other concerned groups to make sure that the marketplace is consumer centric and sustainable and provide safe uh, products as well for consumers uh, going forward. Thanks a lot, uh, Claire, go ahead. Thank you. Well, my, my advice, um, I think would be to, to think big and be creative as I already mentioned, um, and specifically for any company, if, if you're ready to do that, I would really encourage you to join the Climate Pledge so we can work together. Um, there are already over 200 signatories. I'm talking here about businesses, small and large. And, and I think um, we, we, we're all together in this. Um, so really come and join us. Um, perhaps the last word for, for the audience and the other um, panelists here, I was not able to address all the topics that we discussed. <laughs> there was a lot. It was a very interesting discussion. So thank you for that. Um, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I'm happy to answer any remaining question offline. Obviously, I know we're running um, short on time. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I also like those discussions. So perhaps the, the audience here would like to share something. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I would uh, agree with Peter. Uh, in, in an industry where many responsible are there, uh, where the public, the consumer responsible, there is a um, uh, platform is responsible, their producer is responsible. So if someone behaves irresponsibly, then it means there need to be some enforcement on that. So we have to create the awareness as well as we have to enforce it. That's what I would like to say. That's true. And I think, I think uh, the, the one final conclusion we can make is that uh, um, we need to take matters in our hands, all of us, different actors, uh, and, uh, and we need to act, we need to be reflective and uh, um, just, uh, just do our best, think, think a little bit uh, about what we are doing and why we are doing this and what's our goal. Um, think about our values, as I think one of the pa panelists has mentioned in the beginning, um, and just uh, see how we go ahead with, with our consumptionist habits, all, all of us, how we can make it more sustainable. And I think we are perfectly now on time. Uh, Carol, would you like to? I would add like something? to say uh, two words. I really like the message that Niels uh, said. Uh, look out uh, for information you trust, and I uh, ensure you that uh, it could be the Twitter message we could uh, consider to publish uh, in a few hours. Thank you very much for your uh, attention and uh, all the. Uh, panelists, Martina, and all the uh, guests here and outside. Thank you.
Thanks very much. And, and thanks for participating, everybody here and online. And it was really a pleasure and it was, I think, an excellent panel. Thanks a lot and see you soon sometime, hopefully physically.